Well, good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on what part of the country you are calling in from. My name is Ginger Bell, and I will be your host today on the webinar. We'd like to welcome you to the Becoming Independent webinar series. This is a webinar series on how to open your own mortgage business. And across the country, we have been having many originators thinking it is time to step out and open their own mortgage shop. Many in the industry are coming to the realization that there are many advantages to becoming an independent mortgage broker or a non-delegated correspondent lender. And that's why we created this series to answer the questions that many are asking about the differences between broker and non-delegated, talk about the licensing requirements, compliance needs, or marketing platforms that are available. Personally, I'm getting many calls a week asking, what is the first step to get started again with your own mortgage business? And that's exactly why we are holding the Becoming Independent webinar series. We're focusing on what it takes to set up your own mortgage shop. We're going to be having five in this series, and we're going to talk about things like deciding to be a mortgage broker or a non-delegated lender, which we're focusing on today. We're going to talk about setting up your compliance. We're going to look at new trends that have emerged, like mortgage franchising, and we're bringing you the answers that you are looking for and the resources that you need. Now, for some of you, this may be your first time on a, go to, on a Zoom meeting rather than a GoToWebinar meeting. And so I want to go through some of the housekeeping items. First of all, we do have several hundred who have registered for this series. It's been very popular, so we cannot have you um, to have audio capabilities for asking questions, but you can still ask questions. And I know that you all have a lot of questions because you've already been submitting them when you register. But you can listen to this webinar, and you can do it either on your phone or through your computer. You can also ask questions, and there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. There's a question box and a chat box. So either one of those we will see. And I'd like to test that right now so I can make sure that you can hear us and you know how to ask questions. So if you can type either in the question box or in the chat panel, um, let me know what part of the country you are calling in from. And let me know how your weather is. I'm actually in the Pacific Northwest today, and uh, guess what? It's raining. It's true. It does rain here a lot. So let me know how your weather is there. Great. You guys are good. Ah, love it. South Korea, Monty, hello. So good to see you. And I'm sure the weather is good there. Okay, so you all can hear us. Success there. Um, questions? Yes, we are recording this. And so I'm going to go through some of that information. Um, this is a series, as I said. So we have five in a series. This is our Becoming Independent series because, face it, we cannot get through all of this information in one webinar. Our goal of the series is to provide you with information, resources, and experts about becoming an independent originator, to help you determine if this is a viable option for you right now, to answer your questions, and provide you with the steps to getting started, and the resources to help you along the way. So again, welcome to the Becoming Independent webinar series. One of the things that we have available to you is a handout that we have, which is the steps to becoming an independent originator. These are the nine steps here. And if you attend our session um, number two, which will be coming up in two weeks, then we actually have a much more in-depth um, that goes into all the different steps and details exactly what you need. So you'll get this today. You'll get the rest on the next one. So a little teaser for you there. But you can get all the information, the handouts, at this website. You need to go there and register, and then we will um, send you an email with access to the slide deck today and that one-page handout as well. And then we'll also, um, for each session, we'll be doing that and providing you with the information for each session. So we are recording it. Yes, you have access to the slide deck. You can go there and register and get access to that. And then we will be taking questions at the end of the session. So I want to introduce our first um, panelist uh, to you today. Um, this is our first panel that we have in our first session. And Garrett Griffin. Gaff Garrett is the uh, National Non-Delegated Correspondent Manager for Finance of America. So welcome, Garrett. 
Good afternoon. And we have Nate Clear. Nate is the National Account Executive for First Funding. Welcome, Nate. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And we have Jeff Lineland, who is the Senior Vice President of Wholesale for Plaza Home Mortgage. So welcome. And uh, we look forward to going through the information. And I want to begin with Jeff um, to kind of lay the foundation of why we are where we are today. And if you can kind of give just a very brief overview of the history of the industry and what, what has happened through the last several years. Great. Thanks very much, Ginger. Appreciate you having me today. So, you know, as Ginger puts on the slide here, 2008 obviously was the start of the mortgage meltdown. And during that time period or prior to that time period, we saw really large market share for mortgage brokers in particular. And what happened during this time period Time period is simple. It's, uh, I, I really put it down to one word, which was fear. People were scared of a lot of things. First and foremost was compliance. Uh, not just fearful of what happens if I don't do it correctly, but fear of the expense of it, fear of the time it would take away from the origination business. And then, of course, you know, there was obviously the fear of what if I, I, I am not compliant. At the time, obviously, there was a, the beginning uh, of a lot of new regulations, a lot of new rules, and it was really unclear or unknown exactly to what degree. Uh, the regulatory world uh, would be reviewing it. And, and on top of that, the rules were somewhat vague. So there was uh, people trying to make sure that they were meeting certain regulatory rules, but not necessarily having a 100% guarantee that they were. So, you know, that fear drove a lot of people to uh, exit the broker channel. And uh, many entered uh, banks, credit unions, Net branches uh, appeared um, at, at a rapid rate, and most of these were mortgage brokers exiting that channel and moving on to there. Uh, the other thing that that created some fear was the loss of wholesalers. So obviously, the the meltdown of 08 created an environment where a lot of the larger wholesalers exited the business. Uh, after that, we are through that sort of 2008, 2000 through 10 and 11 period, we saw the loss of most of the major financial institutions who were in the wholesale business, large, uh, large money center banks. So they, you know, exited this channel for basically the same reasons that brokers did, fear of compliance, fear of regulatory uh, issues, either currently or down the road. Also, there existed some licensing challenges for certain people. They had, you know, personal financial strains because this obviously was a difficult time next to the Great Depression, the, the second most difficult time in our right. economic history ever. So, you know, we had people, uh, you know, had a lot of personal challenges and, and so licensing became an issue. So that created some people moving into, into banks where they just had to be in a registered status as well. So, you know, there's a lot of safety in numbers and people were looking for uh, leadership and they were looking for ways to navigate. And so they, they flew under uh, sort of large non uh, banking entities or non branches or non banks to to look to try to refinance. Also, I mean to look to try to you know uh, put their hat their hat under. Also, obviously in 2009 there was a lot of refinance opportunity. So you know people were partnering up with servicers as well uh, for that opportunity. I think one of the last reasons why brokers exited was was a PR challenge. You know brokers were pinned as the you know in many cases as the cause of the meltdown. You know whether it's on you know TV movies or whatever. Right, right. You know, bro bro you know, brokers were pinned as as a cause. So uh, I think you know, so much time has passed now that 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 stigma has worn off, and uh, people are actually realizing that the broker stigma now is is one of flexibility, more options, better financial options, possibly you know all, all types of just maybe a broader scope. So. I really feel that that's, that's sort of a history of, of where we were, and then you know we come into where we are today. Right, and that's really the trend that we're seeing right now. So what are you seeing on your wholesale side as far as independent originators re-entering the market? Uh, we're seeing that people want back in. Uh, they're, they're realizing that you know the, that stigma is gone, and in fact, it's actually gone the other way in many markets. 
where uh, people are realizing, hey, you know, there's a lot of advantages to working with a broker. There's a lot of product opportunities. There's a lot of, uh, you know, service benefits to working with an independent originator versus working with a really large institution. Uh, the first and foremost of which is access to product, right? So non-QM is probably the, the arena where we'll see the biggest growth this year as an industry and coming into the, the, uh, the following years. And there's a lot of, uh, of larger institutions that aren't comfortable playing in that arena. They just don't want to offer that product. So as, a, you know, as an independent originator, you have the opportunity to access you know, products from any wholesale, wholesale non-delegated correspondent provider, which is you know, a very, very wide array of products. You know, we're, we're in a market today where every deal counts and you need options. So, you know, in a refinance market, if there's one or two loans that you, you can't do, you, you know, you kind of chuck it up and say, no big deal. There's, there's five more for me to look at. But in today's world, you know, you want to make sure that your referral source doesn't go look somewhere else and possibly create a relationship. You want to make sure you do every loan that you can. So having access to a lot of products, I think is, is a great way to do it. Um, Jeff, think, we're, we're, we're certainly I'm seeing sure. that on the warehouse lending side. Um, you know, when we go back and review the last three months, uh, we've seen that almost 50% of our new applicants are uh, either, you know, retail originators or, or bank uh, operators um, that were, were operating for the, the mortgage end that are saying, hey, with the, the mar margin that's been built into the pricing, um, it was great in the refinance when it didn't matter so much. I could just really work on those relationships, moving more towards that purchase market. They need to be a lot more competitive. Um, and in that, they're looking for you know more control. They want to have control over more of their pricing, uh, more control over the the actual process flow. When you know time to get to the actual closing table is, is becoming more and more of the essence. So certainly hear you on that end. Right. Absolutely. So so Thank Nate, you. with that in mind too, um, you know, obviously you just said fifty percent uh, increase as far as applications that you're seeing that are moving over from retail to become independent. Why do you think that's happening now? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, the the industry as a whole has made it a lot easier. Um, what we've seen is that not only from the warehouse lending standpoint and, and being able to provide uh, kind of an ease of use transition even for an independent originator um, in terms of lower net worth requirements and a lot of additional tools built through technology, the secondary market investors are the same way. Um, if you're able to, to get approved with a warehouse lender, um, then we're able to get you approved and, and we'll be your, your takeout investor on that. Um, in addition, they're creating additional suites of services um, to help supplement not having to hire a closer, a funder, a post closer, which you know, prior to 2008 really wasn't in existence. Um, we also see that through the use of fulfillment service providers that are certainly still around. Uh, being from Texas, we've got plenty of them here that, that we work with as well. Uh, but I think that's probably a, a huge piece of it. Um, wholesale pricing is generally better. Um, secondary market investors, non-delegated correspondent, um, just that core pricing, moving from retail to looking what that, that pricing is. Um, they're oftentimes surprised because they're getting their own pricing sheet and they know that there's some sort of margin built in there, but most of them are of the belief that I'm paying for most of the overhead expense through the flat lender fee or admin fee that's, that's charged to the house. And what they're seeing is that can be quite different, um, you know, anywhere from just 50 basis points to 100, 200 basis points uh, difference, which, which can obviously have an enormous impact on what you're, what you're providing to the borrower. Um, and then I think the last two biggest pieces are control. Um, if you have control over your own margins uh, with that essentially raw pricing, um, you're able to do whatever you need to, to to offer the best deal for that that particular borrower given their particular uh, circumstances, as well as control over recruiting loan officers, control over choosing where those loans go based off of proficiency at the secondary market level, and then branding. Um, branding's, uh, I think, sometimes um, not thought of, uh, especially in making that move. But for a lot of these folks that have spent the last five, 10 years uh, working under somebody else's brand, they really see an opportunity that, hey, this is everything that I've built for somebody else. I'd rather be able to take more control over that branding as myself 
and be able to stamp my name on the top of everything uh, because I'm the one that's getting everything done for them. Absolutely. And so there's a lot of benefits. You talked about control as far as being one of the benefits of being independent. Garrett, what are some of the other benefits for being an independent originator? Well, you know, one of the advantages is, right, when you become independent and you're dealing directly with investors is you have a team of folks at each one of those investors that's working for you, right? Um, if you're typically in a retail situation that has delegated underwriters, you're bound by the underwriters that work for your company for the most part. Um, and one of the first advantages you see is you have the ability to do business with several different people and you have, you have layers that you can go to to advocate for your case, right? So uh, no does not necessarily mean no. You can go to that person, to your account executive. You can go to an underwriting manager. You have a team of account executives that are there to support you and have knowledge of their company uh, and the mortgage loan programs. You know, ideally, they act as a business consultant for you, right? Their job is to show you hopefully how to use that company's resources to expand your business with loan programs and the ability to do loans that you might not be able to. And probably the biggest thing we see, and we, we talked about the better pricing, you know, one of my favorite sayings is there's no free lunch on Wall Street, right? I mean, the retail folks have done a great job, but they've right. got a fixed margin for those bricks and sticks. I would say the average is 120 basis points and up that, of what I've seen out in the marketplace. Um, and when, when the, and then in the wholesale channel, which by the way is great for a lot of people, uh, we have a very vibrant competitive, so does Plaza, they do a phenomenal job in that channel but you, you're bound by a specific compensation plan as a wholesale broker. And we're seeing, as Jeff alluded to, in a purchase market, every deal counts. And you have to be able to compete for every deal and not be bound by one general compensation plan for every loan. You have to be able to compete individually to structure each loan as competitively as you hum humanly can to get it in the door, right? To manage your referral partner's expectations and get those loans to closing. And then finally, you're in direct control of your own overhead and your own p and as an independent business owner, right? You're not sharing p and or expenses or having expenses assigned. It's truly your profit, your, your profit and loss. And so you have the ability to outsource many of these functions, as Nate was alluding to, right, which can be, be passed directly through to the borrower, um, which, you know, ends up being uh, you don't have to have as many full-time employees to be able to offer some of these great things. And, you know, as I alluded to on the compensation, right, as a non-delegated correspondent, you do not have a compensation plan with the investor. Each You're able to set the compensation level literally loan by loan. Exactly. So, Jeff, you talked about the history and what led everybody, um, a lot of mortgage brokers, not every, because I know we did have, we, and we still today have a lot of mortgage brokers and non-delegated correspondent lenders, but the current landscape, what's different now that makes it um, allowable for brokers and non-dels to come back into the market? I think there's uh, there's quite a few reasons. The first and foremost, of which is probably uh, technology and innovation, uh, as well as a large array of of lenders out in the marketplace. So, you know, through technology and through innovation, these lenders have a lot of tools available to uh, smaller independent originators now that were not available a long time ago, uh, where you felt like you had to have a large staff, as as Garrett kind of touched on, to do a lot of uh, let's call it the back office operations for the example of a non -dale. A lot of that's gone now. Technology has taken uh, the ability to, to uh, alleviate a lot of that stress. And the programs that the lenders offer, I think uh, there's, there's a lot more available out there than I believe people probably fully understand. And they should really take the opportunity to leverage uh, true wholesale and non um partners to ask them, you know, question them and say, I'm, I'm interested in this. What do you have to solve this problem? What do you have to solve this problem? There's a lot of uh, things that are out there that I think really create a great, and just to touch on the pricing as well, as, as Garrett touched on, it's, I really feel that it's, it's the best delivery mechanism through independent originators is the best delivery mechanism for the mortgage process to get to the end consumer, both from a price and a service perspective. And I think if that's the case, then, you know, eventually that's where the marketplace will find it. Absolutely. So obviously there's some risks involved and those are some of the questions that we've been getting in for those who are attending the webinar. So um, on those, looking at those risks, Garrett, where, where are those risks and, you know, what can somebody really look at in terms of managing those risks? You know, we have compliance, obviously, 
And that's a necessity because um, they have a lot of requirements, even working with lenders, um, to be able to provide policies to make sure that they're doing things like their AML training. Um, exams, we're seeing in a lot of the state exams that the state examiners have adopted the CFPB examination process. And so a lot of my clients, you know, they're getting in their exams now that the state auditors want to see their policies and procedures. They want to see that they're doing the training. So, so those parts are, are very much real. And we have over uh, the past 10 years been able to, to develop some resources to be able to help um, brokers and non-delegated to be able to handle that element and and I've been involved in creating a lot of those happily and we're going to talk about some of those over the next few uh, webinar series to, to share what's available for mortgage brokers but what additional risks Garrett does a, a broker or a non-del have as far as um, becoming independent well you know the, that's the biggest question I get asked right and the boogeyman is ooh repurchase <laughs> Buying back a loan. That's the boogeyman everybody always talks about. You know, I've been in, in the non-delegated correspondent channel for 20 years and I've never seen a pure repurchase request to a non-delegated correspondent, right? Because if you think about the risk model, you're always going to have misrepresentation, right? You've got that as a broker. You've got it as a non-delegated correspondent. Heck, you've got it as a full delegated correspondent. That exists, right? So obviously, you're going to mitigate your credit risk in the non-delegated role or the wholesale role because your investor is underwriting the loan on your behalf, right? And all good investors today have significant quality control mechanisms and technology that are doing behind the scenes checks to catch any misrepresentation that you may not be aware of, right? So you're managing a large part of it in the underwriting channel. And then you've got closing compliance um, risk. Um, again, that's mitigated today. The two primary things we see in NDC are the use of third-party fulfillment providers, right? And they're basically auditing, auditing the closing, much like an underwriter, to make sure you're compliant and that loan can be purchased. And then there's investor-prepared documents, which at Finance of America we offer. And again, that mitigates a lot of the closing risk. Um, so what, I see, uh, what I've seen, and Nate can chip in on this as well, is I haven't really seen pure buybacks. I have seen some loans that are quote unquote non-purchasable. In other words, something has transpired by the time that it gets to us to buy the loan that makes us not be able to buy that loan. That does not mean you have to buy it back. It does mean you're gonna work with your wheelhouse facility to find an alternative. That, that alternative may be to simply switch that loan to another investor with some repackaging so it meets their guidelines and could be re repurchased. And you know, I would call it worst case and phenomenally rare, uh, a scratch and dent. Uh, which is, you know, that's an investor that's going to buy the loan at a slight discount. Again, you're not buying the loan back. You just may not make money or lose a bit on that one loan, but you're certainly not repurchasing a loan. The reality is, you know, the non-delegated correspondents, if we did demand a repurchase, we're never going to get asked, where do I make the check, right? I mean, that's, okay. just not, that, that's not going to happen. It's going to be something we're going to try to get worked out. You address cash flow. Cash flow does change a little bit on the non-delegated correspondent side because, no one gets paid until the loan is purchased. Um, there's a mechanism called net funding where when, the, when funds are ordered from the warehouse bank, they're going to deduct out all the fees that would be paid at closing, all the interest that was going to be paid at closing, and all the escrows, right, because the borrower's bringing that. So there's only enough to consummate the transaction, and the NDC gets paid when the loan is purchased in the terms of whatever pricing they took and the whole loan value of, at, at the time of purchase. So, you know, again, my job uh, as, you know, as an NDC sales manager is to help mitigate risk for my customers. So I try to work hard with my warehouse partners, fulfillment providers, and other resources to carefully interview the client and make sure they're in a structure that gets that risk as closely to the wholesale channel as we can manage to get it. Absolutely. So with um, the risks on the other side are the rewards. And Nate, you really laid the foundation for this already, talking about control, being a client, not an employee, um, being able to have access to that support, guidance, um, education, compensation, branding. But I want you to dive a little bit more into legacy because that's something that is important to consider. And, you know, really what we're talking about 
been um, building becoming independent is building entrepreneurs and so you know you see that a lot um, especially in your applications now up 50% of uh, originators who were with, with retail that are now coming and starting their own business so what do you see as far as reward with that sure absolutely so uh, thanks for putting the rewards after Garrett uh, Garrett's doom and gloom stuff uh, but no, <laughs> I, I did want to add on to Garrett um, notion there of the, the non-purchasable and the buybacks, I too being in the warehouse lending industry, um, funded roughly 2,000 units a month uh, over last year. I mean, we may have had three or four loans um, that were in a non-purchasable state and all four of them were able to be either refinanced or repackaged to another investor. So certainly nothing to be too, too concerned with. A lot of the uh, secondary market investors are doing a great job of underwriting for both credit and compliance, as I know Plaza and Finance of America both do. Um, and then same thing with the fulfillment providers and the investor prepared docs really helps eliminate a lot of that risk. But Ginger, on to your point, the legacy piece and, uh, and these retail originators moving over into uh, be, becoming independent, owning their own shops. Um, so first, we, you know, we kind of talked about the control piece. Hey, if I'm doing all of this work, why am I doing it for somebody else? I obviously want to be compensated accordingly. Um, it's really difficult for a lot of uh, retail originators to see past doing this other than uh, as a non-delegated correspondent. And the reason why is the pricing fees. If you're locked to a set lender comp agreement with each one of your lenders, although they may vary when they're not supposed to all the time, but um, there's not a lot of margin to build anything so that you're able to grow your, your business. Um, you know, it takes money to, to make money sometimes, and especially if you're trying to build additional personnel, additional loan origination systems, office space, equipment, you need additional margin in, in order to do that. And as a non-delegated correspondent, not being tied to a set lender compensation agreement gives that flexibility as the business owner. From a legacy standpoint, that's important because if you were the originator that was the sole producer starting off, a lot of times folks don't want to be that sole producer, the heaviest producer um, throughout the longevity of that company. Instead, they would like to be able to mentor new loan officers or junior loan officers so that they can kind of take over and, and, and take control of that pipeline and them to be successful. Um, which gives you a revenue stream that isn't directly related to bringing in that next loan, which is part of that legacy piece. So under the non-delegated correspondent channel, having control over your profitability uh, as a whole to build your business operations will also allow those, uh, those that are becoming independent to take control over managing their business uh, instead of strictly only uh, producing. So I'd say that's a big piece of that, that legacy piece is the, the pricing, obviously now being able to administer programs, um, that kind of work-life balance as well, and the work schedule, compensation, and, and building your team. Very good. So you talked about, and we, we haven't really gotten into the choices that you have as far as um, independent. We've talked about it, uh, the benefits, the risks, but now we're going to get into what's the difference, and, and a lot of you have asked that question. You know, what's the difference between mortgage broker and non-DAL? Can I start as one and go to the other? Should I start as both? So now let's really get into talking about what the difference is, and I know Nate, uh, Jim Dunkerley, President of First Funding, did a great job creating this graph, which goes through the loan manufacturing process. And I like the fact that it's color-coded because I'm a very visual person, so you can really get an idea of what this is. And so, you know, looking at those different areas from being a broker to being a non-DAL, and Garrett, I'm going to let you hop on, the, on this as well, but um, what are the primary differences between the two in the loan manufacturing process? Nate, I'll let you start. Sure. Um, so, so what we have here and what we've broken down, I think is important to note is that when we look at creating a loan, the same steps have to be taken in order to get to the finish line, to have an actual mortgage, whether you're in the wholesale channel, whether you're, you're retail, whether you're non-delegated or correspondent, the same steps have to happen. The biggest difference is who's doing those. So what this slide is illustrating 
is who's involved in that transaction and who's responsible for what. And what we can see on the broker side is that in that orange color, most of those functions are being handled by the secondary market investor or wholesale lender on the transaction. So applications going to be taken by a broker. However, the price processing is going to be shared between the broker and the lender or secondary market investor, just because disclosures at that point have to start going out. Um, the underwriting is going to be taken care of, closing, funding, loan delivery, investor review, loan sale purchase, all of that's handled by your secondary market investor. Now, when you move to that non-delegated side, we see that it's moving more to that, that uh, grayish blue color, and that's that the mortgage originator, that non-delegated, is assuming more of that responsibility. Full-on application, all of the initial disclosures, ordering their own appraisal. Now, important pieces, right, the credit risk compliance risk is being uh, offloaded to the secondary market investor for underwriting. Uh, closing, you can use third parties or you can do it in-house or you can utilize the investor. Uh, the funding piece, that's handled internally in, in conjunction with the warehouse lender. Same with the loan delivery and investor review. The mortgage originator is involved in all of those functions in some capacity. And some of those things can be offloaded to the, the secondary market investor. Real quick, I'd like to jump in and say, Nate said it all when he said the wholesale lender, right? That's what dif really differentiates these two channels. On the wholesale side, the mortgage broker is arranging the loan through the wholesale lender. That loan is disclosed and closed in the name of that wholesale lender. On the non-delegated correspondent side, the loan is disclosed and closed in the name of the non-delegated correspondent, and he's selling the loan. And well, I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail later, but that generates a bevy of benefits to the non-delegated correspondence because he has complete control of the timing and the content of the disclosures. I think that's a Texas term, a bevy of benefits. I like that. <laughs> Indeed. So Garrett. I didn't say y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. The difference too, and, and you alluded to this a little bit when we talked earlier, but compensation. So go through the difference of compensation between being a broker and being a non-DEL. As, as a mortgage broker, you can only be paid one of two ways. Lender paid comp or borrower paid comp. Um, and you have a set compensation agreement with each investor that you do business with. And that ultimately trickles down to your internal comp agreement with your loan officers. So again, lender paid, borrower paid. And if you're, you're out there uh, and you're trying to compete for a loan and you priced it with lender paid comp, and then you've got to turn around and change that to borrower paid comp, um, that can be a tricky uh, proposition at best, right? So there's some limitations in the way that works. By the way, I'm not saying it doesn't work for everybody. There's some brokers that, that, that this methodology seems to work for. On the non-delegated correspondent side, there is no compensation agreement between the non-delegated correspondent and the investor. The only comp agreement resides between the non-delegated correspondent and his loan officer. And what that means is you have the ability, I've used the example, if you have a two and three quarters comp plan with your investor and you're getting a full, a full high conforming loan, say a $453,000 conforming loan with a borrower that's got an 800 FICO score, that borrower shopping around and it may be very difficult to sell a two and three quarters comp plan. Right. As a non-delegated correspondent, because you don't have a comp plan with that investor, you can price that loan as skinny as you need to to bring it in the door. Right. And further, in the non-delegated correspondent channel, one of the magic things that happens is because you're selling a loan, that creates what's called a secondary marketing transaction. So what used to be called, and I hate using this world, the old yield spread premium or above par pricing, that becomes service release premium. And service release premium is paid at loan purchase. Therefore, it doesn't exist at the closing table. So it does not have to be disclosed to the borrower. It's, it, it's actually, it doesn't exist until the loan is purchased. Therefore, a non-delegated correspondent can earn fees at closing from the borrower and earn fees at loan purchase from the investor. So a non-delegated correspondent can be paid by either the borrower or the investor or both. 
And that's one of the biggest differences between the non-delegated correspondent channel and the broker channel, Ginger. Very good. Well, thank you. So now, Jeff, I want to go into, and I, I get this question all the time, and I'm sure you do too. Can I be both broker and non-delegated correspondent? Absolutely. In fact, at Finance of America, we approve every single non-delegated correspondent also as a wholesale customer. Right. Um, and the reason that we do that is most of the non-delegated correspondents that we work with are not directly approved with HUD, right? So they still need to table fund FHA loans. Um, any non-delegated correspondent can automatically close any agency product, any VA loan, or any USD loan in their name. But if they're not directly approved by HUD, they would need to wholesale their um, FHA loans. But taking that a step further, there's just some loans that maybe some of our non-delegated correspondents are not comfortable with. Um, uh, funding as a non-del, so they can do either or, um, and they don't. And if they become a non-delegated, they don't have to come non-delegated with every investor they do business with. So they they can enjoy the best of both worlds. They can they can take the products that best fit their needs and close those as a non-delegated correspondent, and then they still have the option of their table funded investors for the products they so choose to fit in that model. Excellent, absolutely. And we, Jeff, I know you see a lot of that at Plaza too, right? Yeah, just to add on to that, a lot of it's driven by your warehouse provider and, and what you're able to warehouse, what you're not able to warehouse. Uh, there'll be certain instances beyond just product, but, uh, you know, driven by loan parameters as well, where you may elect to uh, broker it. So uh, like at Plaza, when you register in our new Breeze system, when you register your loan, you simply select whether I'm deciding to do it as a non-Dell mini correspondent or whether I'm deciding to do it as a broker. And there's a lot of reasons that may be driving that. It may be, uh, you know, you're, uh, you know, you just may not even have capacity on your warehouse line. Hopefully that's the problem for you, which is a good business problem to have. But uh, normally it could be, you know, just the parameters of the deal. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Again, probably a lot more than, than people really understand. Right. And I think a lot of people always have a question. I know I did a, a webinar yesterday on the 203K loans. And so questions were coming in, you know, hey, I'm a non-Dell. How do I do this? Can I still do FHA? So I think there's really a lot of people out there that still don't understand you can do both. Absolutely. And from the warehouse lending standpoint, there's, there's sometimes a loan product that you're going to be better off from a risk standpoint. Having brokered those, um, and we at First Funding are certainly more than happy to work with our customers or prospective customers on identifying which loans are going to be excellent for, for warehouse lending and the ones that aren't, aren't going to be so much. Um, those construction loans, if there's anything that gets a little squirrely, it makes it a lot diff more difficult to refinance that borrower, whereas in wholesale, you've got a, a much more protected environment. Um, same with lower FICOs and, and, uh, and higher DTIs and, and loans that you may have some more questions about. Right, which brings you know, well, us into the benefits too. And Garrett, I'm going to let you go ahead and talk about that because that's one of the things of the benefits of being a non-delegated is, is managing that that you're talking about, Nate, as far as when to make that decision um, and being able to, to provide uh, those options. So Garrett, what are some of the additional benefits, not only to being an independent, but to being a non-delegated correspondent? Well, I'm going to focus on the benefits of non-delegated for these overall benefits, but many of them apply to the wholesale channel as well. Um, the biggest benefit that, and the number one attribute I hear from the non-delegated correspondents that I've worked with over the years is they love the control they have. Uh, in today's world, um, they basically are able to immediately generate the loan estimate in their name, right? And they're able to control the fees that they're, that they're putting on the loan estimate as a non-delegated correspondent. So what that means is, is effectively they can take a loan application, get the loan estimate signed it immediately, um, get a, an intent to proceed signed immediately, and order an appraisal immediately. Um, as a non-delegated correspondent um, at Financial America, as an example, we offer our, our, our um, non-delegated the ability to have air independence and order the appraisal from any AMC that they're comfortable doing business with that you're compliant. Um, so theoretically, you know, in one day, right, they could get an application, get an LE side, get an intent to proceed side, and order the appraisal the same day. And that translates to getting your file into underwriting faster. Um, but, and, and the non-delegated correspondent, and to a certain extent, mortgage brokers also control the timing of the closing documents. Um, they can basically issue the CD and upon loan approval as soon as they've locked the loan um, and get, that, get their documents ready way in advance. Um, they're in control of the service offering and the value proposition. Again, as a, as a non-delegated correspondent, 
by virtue of some of the compensation things that we talked about, you know, it's possible to disclose the loan as a non-DEL with no lender fees, right? Because you're able to get paid service release premium at loan purchase to offset those fees. So you can actually put out an initial LE that has zero lender fees to compete for more purchase business where that's appropriate. Um, you know, and, and again, the pricing flexibility of not having that compensation plan directly with the lender really affords you the ability to go in and price each individual loan on its own merits based on the borrower attributes to have the most competitive offering on the street for every quote that you put on the street. And that's going to translate into more deals coming in the door. Um, and, and as Jeff alluded to, you know, there's a vast array of products that have hit the market. I know Plaza's got a suite of, Q, of non-QM stuff. We have some non-QM stuff. There's a lot of additional products that have come to market now that make doing more deals than, than have in the past possible today. So, you know, it's, it's really, this is a path to independence, right? And it, it, regardless of where you are, if you're a retail branch, it's, you know, the path is you can become a mortgage broker or you can directly become an NDC, but you can become a mortgage broker, then become an NDC. Um, everyone on this call is an expert in helping people transition to the, even the next level if they want to get direct FHA approval. Um, you know, we enjoy what, what, what excites me in the morning is helping my non-delegated correspondent partners grow to the next level. And I think that the independence that's offered through the business channel affords the opportunity for our candidates to do just that. And, and that really brings us to the next topic, which is the environment today. Um, and everyone has talked about that. Obviously, a very competitive environment. Pricing is important. Um, being the expert is important. So um, I'll let you kind of recap this, Garrett. Why be an MDC? Again, if you have the ability to control the process by which you're disclosing, control the process, of who you're ordering the appraisal from and when you're ordering the appraisal, you're getting faster underwrite approvals, you're in control of not only ordering the closing documents, but the content on the CD, that's going to translate to you being a lender in the marketplace. And it's going to grow your business. Good loan officers that are trying to, or that are looking for a home, are looking for the opportunity to go to work for a lender where they have control of these things to help more, to help bring in more deals. And as I alluded to, right, you have the ability to match each individual customer to the product and price that best meets their needs. And you, again, you're in, you're in control of compliance, closing, meeting your referral sources expectations, and having the ability to balance your risk and rewards. Simply put, independent originators are more efficient than big box retailers, right? And that's how they're able to offer a better, a better price and typically have more direct control over the service of the manufacturing process to offer a better experience to the customer. And you, again, you, it's all rolling that into one big ball and you've got it, all of a sudden you've got this giant value proposition to recruit more loan officers, find more referral partners, close more loans on it, more on time and get more deals in the door. Absolutely. So Nate, I know First Funding does the best in the industry as far as helping brokers transition to become non-delegated lenders. And that's a question that I always get, especially for our retail operators that are saying, hey, I want to you know, get started. Should I start as a broker? Should I jump in and be non-DAL? So you know, let's riddle me this. Can we do that? Can you start as a broker and become non-DAL? Can you that's, that's go the true. other way? Right. So, so uh, we generally get this in, in two phases, right? Uh, with the de novo companies, somebody that's moving from retail that has previous experience um, of at least day-to-day -day operations and originating loans, making that transition. And, and the answer is absolutely. You can start as start out as a non-delegated correspondent, um, and and certainly we're happy to to work with you and, and de novo entities to get approved with as little as a $75,000 net worth in your company and, and some decent credit. Um, we like to put a lot of, I guess, safety nets in place when they're, they're first getting started in terms of um, ensuring that they're getting started with a, a quality uh, account executive and secondary market investor that's going to work with them or alongside side them in the uh, underwriting for credit and, and compliance. The other side of it is, is sometimes we do have loan officers that are moving over that, that haven't managed a business at all. And it really kind of comes down to what their previous experiences have been um, and if they're able to work with the secondary market investor on that non-delegated channel. Um, 
sometimes there does need to be a 60, 90 days of submitting loans in the broker channel before you're able to make that, that step over. And certainly anybody that's new to industry that's just looking to jump in kind of wide, eyes wide open, um, a, a lot of caution there. I think you'd be, you'd be better served in that broker community um, where the wholesale lender uh, is able to help you with the processing, the underwriting, the coordination of your closing, coordination of your funding, and you're not worrying about anything on that, that back end, especially as you go into uh, being a new owner. And as Garrett has alluded to and, and, uh, and Jeff, a lot of our guys are set up in both capacities, um, that they do want to have both options for so that they are able to deliver an array of products um, so that they can pitch those to their potential um, borrowers, but also to mitigate that risk. So happy to help anybody that wants to move into that. And if you want to have a, a conversation um, outside of this call, more than happy to do that for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have contact information for everyone. I know a lot of you are typing in with questions and how to get in touch with everyone. So we'll be providing that information as well. So we have great lenders, warehouse facility providers here. Um, Jeff Plaza has been around since 2001. I know Kevin Parr and James Kudry um, made it through the mortgage meltdown that we talked about and, uh, and continued the commitment um, to wholesale for a long, long time. So what are the benefits of uh, moving over and, and really working with wholesale lenders like Plaza and like Finance of America? I think the benefits, you know, these I'm really put these into three buckets, right? So the first three uh, are really what I call service, right? So we're an extension of the independent originators team. Uh, we're basically, I don't want to say we're employees, we work for you, but we act like that. We're only as good as our ability to earn your business on any given transaction. Uh, you know, that that differs from other environments where, you know, you may be forced to work with a certain underwriter or you're driven a certain way and, and you're there, even though you may or may not agree. So we, we're earning your business on every transaction. Uh, the next two, competitive pricing and choosing compensation, there's flexibility there. You have the ability to figure out how to make deals work, how to uh, price where you need to on certain transactions, either, um, you know, mostly in the non deal world, but there's, there's ways to do this, you have borrow paid, you have lender paid, you have options. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And really the last four is, you know, pick a, pick a dedicated wholesaler who understands our business. There's a lot of people entering the wholesale world today, uh, mostly um, companies that maybe haven't done wholesale before, they were real, retail focused and they're trying to get into it because let's be honest, we have a smaller pie than we used to have. So people are entering it. You know, as, as Ginger said, we've been doing this for 18 years. We are a dedicated TPO company. We only originate wholesale and correspondent production. And we're a true partner. Uh, and we don't compete with you for your, your business, your referral sources. So pick someone who's experienced. Uh, most of our staff have been doing this 20 plus years. They understand uh, how to navigate, how to help people, especially people that are new to this origination channel on how to be successful. So. Pick your partners wisely. Uh, also pick somebody who has a, a broad product array. One just quick hint, and I'll let you go, Ginger, is that, uh, you know, you don't need 10, 12 companies to work with. You need uh, a few companies. The, the fewer that you can work with and cover all of your needs, the better off you're gonna be because it's less uh, policies and procedures you have to worry about for each company. So if one of your companies uh, has a very broad product menu, then you can check a lot of boxes off your list, yet you're still working with the same you know, account executive, the same team, you understand lock policies. It's not that you're having to try to understand 10 different lenders. So I think that's one of the keys and the people that I've seen really flourish in the last few years have taken that model under their wing and it really works for them. Absolutely, and truly becomes part of the team. And Jeff, I'm gonna let you close us out as far as a recap of the top reasons, and then we're gonna go into questions. We are getting a lot of questions in. I'm gonna kind of go through those while you're recapping, Jeff, and then we'll answer some of those. Okay, great. Well, we, we, we've talked a lot about control, right? You, you retain and complete the control. Uh, as we mentioned, you're a client, not employee. As I just mentioned previously, we're, you know, companies are earning your business every day. You're not uh, in a situation where you're not able to com have people compete for your business, which is always a good thing. There's a ton of support. 
uh, again, probably more than people understand. People, companies like uh, the ones that are on this call today offer a plethora of resources available that, um, that you can tap into. So utilize, ask questions, people can help you out. Compensation, I'm just gonna say flexible. Whether you're in the non-Dell world or the wholesale world, there's probably more opportunity there than, than you know, and the ability to open up. As we, as we started off, you know, this is a market where you don't wanna miss a deal. You don't want your referral source having to go somewhere else. You want flexibility to try to do every loan that you can, and, and becoming an independent orig originator allows you to do that. Branding and legacy, we can sort of lump together. Right? You're, you're creating something that you can now do something with versus uh, being an employee situation. You're also able to control your messaging and control the service that you're able to offer uh, to your clients and to your referral sources. The ability to do it the way you wanna do it. Again, with technology and uh, innovation out there, there's a lot of things that you can do now as an independent person that you couldn't do years ago. And you can give the, the, uh, the feeling that you're much larger than you probably are. Um, you know, better options. I, I tend to focus a lot on the programs because I think that's key in today's world. Uh, pricing, uh, you know, you work when you want to, and you have teams. Again, focus on partnering with somebody who really has your best interest in mind, and you not only have yourself and your team, but you have their team as well that are also working for you to make sure that you're successful. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to go through a couple of questions, and if you have a questions, please type them in your question box or uh, into your chat box. And I'm going to throw this out here, and I'm not sure who wants to answer it, but whoever wants to jump in. Uh, question in, can a new LO who just got their license um, start as a mortgage broker? I, I, so, uh, I guess mortgage broker, go ahead. Garrett, or non-Dell too. Yeah. I think both of you can answer that as far as, because I know there's non-Dell requirements as well, but Nate, if you want to hop in on that, I know you know the answer. Yeah, that was, that was one of the, the things that I was, I was alluding to is that if you're a brand new loan officer that's just entering the market, broker being independent is going to be your best option. Um, and, and certainly each one of those um, secondary market investors or wholesale lenders are going to better, better be able to direct you as far as the approval process with them as an independent and loan, new loan officer. Excellent. Um, and Jeff, I know um, this, you'll be able to answer this for Plaza and Garrett, you can jump in for what requirements are for Finance of America. But the question is, do you require brokers to use a specific origination software? Uh, the answer is no. They, there's lots of systems that work. You basically just need to get it into a FANI 3.2 file, and that will allow you to work with pretty much any lender out there. So, again, options. I concur. As long as we can get a compliant application with the correct disclosures, we're good. Good to go. Um, we also had a question come in. Can you review, review the net worth requirements to open up a, a new mortgage company? I can talk to you for Finance of America for a broker, it's 25,000. For a non-delegated correspondent, it's 75,000 are the minimums. From the Jeff, warehouse uh, lending. Go ahead, Nate. So from a warehouse lending standpoint, our, our, our core requirements are a 75,000 unaudited net worth in the company, uh, and then a 630 or greater credit mid score for any principal owners with 10% or more ownership. Jeff, did you uh, want to hop on? Part, I was just say we we mirror what Garrett said for Finance America. So, okay, very good. You know, we have a lot of other questions <clears throat> talking about the steps to take, and so <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and close it out there because we are coming up on an hour, and I'm going to have the opportunity for our panelists to share some information about their company. So, Garrett, I'm going to start with you if you can talk about some of the benefits of working with Finance of America. I just like to share we're the direct communication lender. Uh, our customers are able to speak directly to our underwriters, our loan purchase team, and any member of our organization. Um, you know, in the world of automated underwriting, you're really kind of pre-underwriting your own loan. It's about getting your conditions cleared. And you know, I think it's critical to be able to speak directly to an underwriter to get down the road and find out what you need to move forward. Um, we do have a dedicated team. If you're a non-delegated correspondent, a dedicated non-delegated correspondent underwriters, um, you know, our system is straightforward and easy to use. And um, you know, our loan purchase team is unique in that 
the same person that originally uh, reviews your file for loan purchase takes it all the way through the purchase process, so there's no assembly line process. Um, and it would be my distinct privilege to help anybody interested in moving forward in that. Give me a call, and I'll do the best I can to give you my best guidance. Excellent. Thank you. And Nate, um, tell us a little bit about the advantages and opportunities working with First Funding. Sure. Uh, so First Funding, we're well, you know, primarily uh, assisting those that are interested in making that transition into non-delegated, making that dream possible. Um, some things that make us unique in the industry is certainly our technology approach. Uh, providing you with tools like our fast pass option for wire requests, the only warehouse lender to provide a 400 point uh, data integrity review within an hour um, so that you know that when those funds are out the door, um, you become essentially pregnant with that loan that we've done everything we can to ensure that, that everything uh, is consistent throughout. Um, we provide 1098 reports as well as all of the documentation that you need for LMLS call reports plethora of resources. So anybody that is interested, I, I uh, implore that you reach out to our website, firstfundingusa.com. There's tons of uh, useful information and diagrams and tools. Um, we have had the privilege of working with Ginger and developing a first funding university. Uh, certainly want to be a resource for you and love to be your warehouse funder. Excellent. Thank you. And Jeff, talk about the opportunities working with Plaza. Great, thanks, Ginger. We're uh, we're basically what I consider uh, the tenured, experienced wholesale lender with a wide array of products. So we, as I mentioned, we've been doing this 18 years. We have a lot of people uh, that understand this industry, um, frontwards and backwards, both wholesale and the non dell world. So um, give us a call if you have any questions, or visit our website, and you can make an inquiry there. We there's there's very few products in the marketplace that we don't offer, so we can fill that void to say, listen, you know, if I work with Plaza, I'm covering pretty much every product I could possibly want. Um, and then finally, the big thing is we're, we don't really have a retail focus, so we're not going to be competing with you. You're not going to see branches open up down the street from you. We're not going to compete competing with you in the realtor offices for referrals. So we really are a, a true third party supporter uh, of those channels and we'd love to work with you. So thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you. So I want to share with you, we have uh, handouts for you today. I am recording this session. I know I've received several emails from you and comments wanting to know if you can have access to the recording. I will be sending out an email to everyone that will come out tomorrow and uh, we'll be posting that. I'll be posting it on my YouTube channel as well. So we have a recording there so you can go back and listen. And I will have the entire series, but you can register for the handouts at mortgagetoolkits.com. Enter your information. That's actually my website. And so I'll be communicating with you on information. And our goal in doing this is to be able to start building a resource tools. You know, there's really nothing out there that puts all of these resources together for mortgage uh, brokers and, and non-delegated correspondents. And so that's our goal is to be able to provide these resources. And also our goal in putting together the series. So we do have a total of five in the series. Today was session one and we talked about the benefits. Uh, session two will be on April 26th. And we're going to talk about taking the first step. And so I have, for our panelists, we have uh, a license specialist, so someone their business is getting, um, helping individuals get licensed. And, um, and then we will also have information as far as some new trends that are happening, including mortgage, fr mortgage franchising. I know I'm getting uh, several comments. We have some real estate agents that are on this webinar that are wanting to know how they can start uh, to, do, to become a mortgage uh, originator. And so that's the, the webinar you want to attend for that. Our session three, we're gonna talk about compliance management resources. So what do you need for your policies, for your procedures, for your mortgage call reports, um, for things that uh, Nate and Garrett talked about if you're an NDC about outsourcing some of those compliance resources, we'll have those available. Our session four, we'll talk about marketing, website, social media, and then our session five, then we're going to bring it all together. So any additional questions we have that we didn't cover and building out a resource for you and a list of what those resources are. And that's really our goal in developing the Independent Originator Series. So go to the website, Independent Originator. All of those webinars are on there. You can register for all of those. And uh, I'll be sending follow-up email to you tomorrow 
it'll come from me, my personal email address, Ginger Bell. So if you do have any additional questions, feel free to email me. If you go to either one of those websites, you can click on each one of our partners and have access to their contact information. And I would like to thank our partners for helping to make this available. And it truly is uh, an entire um, industry. We need to come together to be able to, to help to build uh, the entrepreneurs, the independents. So to our panelists, Garrett, Jeff, Nate, I want to thank you very much. For those who attended, I want to thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all in a couple weeks for the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ginger. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.